Some researchers are saying that as many as 1 billion people are being affected by sleep apnea. Now, there's something that's called the Seattle Protocol. And this is a method that was invented by a few different dentists. And it's a series of six different steps that patients can go through to resolve either their sleep apnea or their sleep disordered breathing. And the first step in that protocol is to simply get the patient to breathe through their nose all night long. There is a significant amount of people that can resolve their sleep apnea with this one step alone. And also about 50 to 60% of people that do this one step can also resolve all of their dental issues that come with sleep apnea. Sleep apnea isn't just affecting one part of your body. It manifests in a ton of different ways. And a lot of dentists have different signs that they look for that signal some sort of breathing obstruction or even sleep apnea. These include bruxism or in other words, tooth wear, like when people grind their teeth or when they clench their teeth when they're sleeping. Also TMJ pain. Also if your bite is off, so if you ever start chewing something and you feel like your bite kind of changed, that could be part of it. Also dental erosion. Erosion is basically when some sort of acid is attacking your tooth. And this isn't really a cavity. It's more just like some sort of punched out lesion. A lot of times you'll see these lesions along the gum line. Also just cavities in general are more likely when people have sleep apnea. And also impacted teeth. So a lot of crooked teeth or teeth that just don't come in the right position or teeth that can't even erupt at all because there's just no room. Nasal breathing and mouth taping are nothing new. And this even dates back to the early 1900s, where the first ads for different types of chin straps or different devices to keep your mouth shut were first introduced. And this continued with the Russian doctor named Dr. Konstantin Buteko. Now, he was doing a lot of research on the optimal breathing for astronauts. And this was during the Cold War. So it was during that Soviet space race. And in the 1950s, he developed a method called Buteko mouth taping. Basically, it's just a strip of tape that goes over your mouth. And he really did not get known that well for a while because of the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. And it wasn't until the 1990s where other people started adopting his work. And we even saw something in the 1990s called gentle paper tape, where Australian teachers began taping their lips shut at night. Sleep apnea is measured using something called the AHI, or the Apnea Hypopnea Index. This measures the amount of apneas, or the amount of times where you stop breathing, and the hypopneas, or the amount of times where your oxygen levels start going down. And this is measured per every hour of your sleep. And it's made by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So mild sleep apnea means you have about 5 to 15 events per hour. So 5 to 15 events of this apnea or this hypopnea. Moderate means you have 15 to 30 events per hour. And severe sleep apnea is when you have over 30 of these events in a single hour. So there was a study that was demonstrating what can happen when people have some sort of nasal obstruction. And it was measuring the amount of oxidative stress that you get. So there was 30 different participants. 10 of the people had an AHI of over 30. So they had very severe sleep apnea. 10 of the people snored a lot and their AHI was less than 15. So they had more mild sleep apnea, but they still had sleep apnea. And 10 people didn't have any sleep apnea. Their AHI was less than 5, but they did have some sort of nasal respiratory impairment. So they had trouble breathing through their nose. All of these three groups had the same amount of oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is what causes a lot of the diseases that are associated with sleep apnea. So the study was showing that the problem really is a block of nasal breathing. And this is what can cause the pathogenesis or the disease of sleep apnea. Your nose is responsible for more than 50% of the total resistance of the upper airway. So if you have a partial or even a complete block of the nose, this can cause sleep apnea. And there was another study kind of further showing that mouth breathing can actually lead to sleep apnea. So this study evaluated people's airway resistance overnight. And they compared people that breathe through their nose all night versus people who breathe through their mouth all night. And what they found is there was a 2.5 times increase in the upper airway resistance in people who breathe through their mouth versus people who breathe through their nose. So people who breathe through their mouth 
had 2.5 times more resistance in their airway. That means that they had to fight 2.5 times as hard to get air into their lungs. Now, where did that resistance come from? Why is it that when you open your mouth to breathe versus when you breathe through your nose, that you have way more resistance in that air getting to your lungs? Well, the study kind of described why. Because when you open your mouth and you breathe through your mouth, your upper airway is way more likely to collapse. So one reason your airway is more likely to collapse is because when your jaw opens, it moves back. Your mandible moves back and it moves down. And this can kind of block your oral pharynx. Basically, it's blocking your throat. So when this blocks your throat, it can cut off your airway because the diameter of that airway gets smaller. What happens when you breathe through your mouth is your body gets all this oxygen at once. But the airflow is very turbulent. It's not very consistent. And obstructive sleep apnea is characterized by this turbulent, abrupt transition in your airway. So your air will start to enter a more confined space because first it enters your mouth and then it goes into your throat. And as we described before, that throat gets more constricted when you breathe through your mouth. And what happens when that air enters that confined space in your throat is it increases the negative pressure. And this is based on physics. It's called Bernoulli's principle. And this makes the airway collapse. And this is what causes sleep apnea. Now, going back to the study, they found that when people were breathing through their mouth all night versus breathing through their nose, they had way more of these apneas and hypopneas. So their AHI score was way higher. The AHI score for the mouth breathers in the study was 43. And for the nose breathers, it was 1.5. So the mouth breathers had very severe sleep apnea and the nose breathers didn't have any sort of sleep apnea. And this is the only thing they were changing in the whole study, whether you were breathing through your mouth or breathing through your nose all night. Now, one thing I hear all the time is I can't breathe through my nose because my nose is always blocked. So what am I supposed to do? Well, there is a natural way to unblock your nose. Unblocking your nose comes down to three simple steps but each step is very important. So step number one is to clean your nose. Now you might be wondering, well, I showered today and I washed my nose when I showered. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the inside of your nose. So before you start, you wanna make sure that you consult your doctor about this and go over what you're gonna do with them, especially if you had some sort of nasal surgery recently. So the first step to cleaning your nose is to blow your nose, right? Pretty obvious but you wanna do it correctly. So you gotta do it one nostril at a time. The second thing you wanna do is a saline rinse in your nose. Now this is something you can do right before sleeping. A really popular brand is one by Neil Med. It's called the Neil Med Sinus Rinse. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or any drugstore. And when you use this saline rinse, you wanna make sure you lean forward as far as possible over the sink, and this'll prevent it from getting down your throat, and it'll also make sure it enters all your sinuses. Now. Some of this solution might enter your ears. If that does happen, it's okay, it's not a big deal. It's gonna fall out on its own. There is a way to prevent this saline rinse from getting into your ears. So as you're putting this rinse in your nose, keep making this cut sound. No, it sounds weird, but as it's in your nose, keep making cut, cut, cut. And this will help prevent it from getting into your ears because now your soft palate's gonna start getting activated. Now, when you use this saline rinse, you're gonna put it in one nostril and it's gonna come out the other. If you've never done this before, it's gonna feel really weird, but you're gonna get used to it and it's definitely gonna help clean out your nose so you can start breathing through your nose again. And you probably wanna put half in one nostril and half in the other to get the best results to clean your nose properly. And if it does enter your ears or if it does feel like all of it isn't coming out right away, it's not a big deal, it will work itself out eventually. You can even try blowing your nose after to get some more of that out or even bobbing your head a little bit but don't worry, it will come out. Now, the last step to clean your nose is to use a nasal spray. So my favorite nasal spray is something called Clear, but it's with an X, so it's spelled X-L-E-A-R. This nasal spray has xylitol in it. So xylitol is very cool to use in a nasal spray for a few different reasons. First is, it's a surfactant. So this is what's used in a lot of different detergents, but you're not putting detergent in your nose. But this is what helps that xylitol keep your nose clean, and it's gonna help remove a lot of debris and other junk from your nose. Also, it's an antifungal and antibacterial, so it's gonna further help prevent any infections and keep everything clear. So you're gonna wanna use this 
five times a day. I know that sounds like a lot, but this is the best way to make sure that you get your nose open again. Because when your nose is stagnant for such a long period of time, it gets more and more clogged and it's really hard to start using it again. This is why so many people cannot breathe through their nose. But once you get through these steps, you won't have to do this every single day. Now, after you use this nasal spray and you blow your nose, you're ready for step two unless you have allergies. Now, if you have allergies, we're gonna add one extra step at the end of it, and that's to take an allergen. So Claritin or whatever your favorite different uh, antihistamine is, you're gonna add that as well. Now, step two is a nasal opening exercise. Now, the way to do this exercise is you're not gonna use your mouth at all. So you're gonna keep a finger over your mouth and you're gonna take a small inhale and exhale through your nose, so. And you're gonna start walking while holding your breath. So after you take that breath, pinch your nose and take as many steps as you can until you have a very strong urge to breathe. Now, I want you to be careful here. You don't wanna hold it as long as you can. If after you're done with this part, you have to take a very deep breath and it takes you like a whole minute just to recover, you held it a little too long. You want it to be a strong urge, but you want to be able to recover after a couple of breaths. So once you have that urge to breathe, you breathe in and out through your nose and you start controlling your breathing. You don't want to take very deep breaths. Maybe your first breath or two can be a little bit bigger, but after that, it should calm down a little bit. And after that, you want to have relaxed breathing only through your nose for one minute. And again, you want to try to keep this breathing very silent and hard to see. So you don't wanna see like your stomach or your chest rising or anything like that. Try to keep it very minimal. Now, as you're recovering and as you're breathing through your nose, if you open your mouth again and you start breathing through your mouth, you also are gonna start over because you messed up. And you'll find that if you open your mouth to breathe again, your nose will probably congest very quickly again. Now, you're gonna repeat this exercise for a total of six times. So again, the steps are, you're not gonna use your mouth, you're gonna only use your nose, you're gonna take a quick inhale and exhale, very light breath, and you're gonna walk as many steps as you can until you have a strong urge to breathe. Now, if you don't have a lot of room to walk or you don't want people to watch you doing this, or if you're in a confined space, you don't have to walk, you could just start bobbing your head. Now, this will look a little weird, but if you're alone, then who cares? But basically what it's gonna look like is you're gonna hold your breath and you're gonna start bobbing your head back and forth. Kind of like that. And this is kind of doing the same thing and it's still gonna work and it's still gonna help unclog your nose. So whichever one works better for you, either way you're gonna take one minute breaks, only breathing through your nose and you're gonna repeat this exercise for a total of six times. Now step number three, if you made it here, congratulations because this is the easiest step of them all. All you're gonna do is tape your mouth shut. Now you can use any different tape you see online. There is something called 3M Micropore paper tape there's different types of tape that have a hole in the middle so that they kind of resist your lips from being closed, but they don't actually force it to be closed. But at this point, you should be able to breathe through your nose all night long. So if you're doing this right before bed, this will help you sleep while breathing through your nose all night. Now, I recommend if you're just using one strip of tape to do it vertically and not horizontally, because this way, if you have to breathe through your mouth, you still can through the sides of it. Now, again, there's other types of tape available. You can find whichever one works best for you. I don't really think it really matters too much. Just make sure it's safe for the skin. And when you're taping your mouth, some tips you can add are one to fold the edges of the tape. Now, this will make it a lot easier to remove. And this is something I had to learn the hard way because it started ripping out my mustache and my beard hairs, and it was very painful. So folding the edges can help a lot and also Sometimes these tapes can get really sticky and you don't need it to be that sticky when you're putting it on your face. So just dabbing that tape on a cloth two to three times will help a lot and make it not so sticky, but it'll still be sticky enough so that it can resist your lips from opening and encourage you to breathe through your nose all night long. Now again, you don't have to do this exercise every single day, but if your nose is really congested and you haven't used your nose to breathe in a while, it's gonna take some work. It's not gonna happen overnight. And the more you use your nose, the easier it will be because the more it will start dilating your nasal passages because you're basically reminding your body that you have this nose and you have these wonderful features in your nose and it'll start allowing you to breathe through your nose some more. 
There is some science behind it, but that's basically the dumbfounded way of looking at it. Now, if your nose is always dormant, it will most likely always be blocked because mouth breathing actually causes nasal congestion. So mouth breathing is why people's noses are blocked in the first place. Now, you might look at me like I'm crazy, but you have these breathing receptors in your brain. And one of these breathing receptors is responsible for looking at the volume of air coming in and out of your lungs. And if it sees that the volume is way too high, then it's going to try to block how much air is coming in and out. Now, this breathing receptor basically assumes that you're breathing through your nose. So if you're breathing through your mouth, it's not going to register that. But the thing is, when you're breathing through your mouth, the volume of air that you're exchanging in and out of your lungs is way too high. And it's way higher than it would be if you breathe through your nose. And the simple reason is mouth breathers tend to take these shallower, quicker breaths and they start breathing quicker and quicker. And they're doing this upper chest breathing. And this is just increasing the amount of volume of air that's being exchanged. And what happens is you start losing CO2. So CO2 or carbon dioxide is this molecule that's produced in your body. And this is what we exhale. When we breathe out, we're breathing out excess CO2. Now, the key word here is excess. If we're breathing out too quickly, now we're losing way too much CO2. And we're not talking about excess anymore. We're talking about CO2 that our body needs to be metabolically healthy. So the CO2 is what controls our blood pH, and it also helps deliver our oxygen to our cells. And if we lose too much CO2, then our body is going to try to resist breathing as much so that we can retain some of the CO2 because our pH can get thrown off. And if our pH in our body gets thrown off, then our cells cannot live anymore. So the CO2 is very important. This is why this is happening to your nose. And this is why you have so much mucus being produced. Because when your brain sees how much volume of air is being exchanged, and it realizes that you're losing way too much of the CO2, it starts blocking your nose and it starts producing more mucus in your nose. And this is going to resist you from breathing. And the problem is you keep breathing through your mouth so that it's a never ending cycle and your body keeps producing more and more mucus. This is why you have to train your body to start using your nose again. And this is why it doesn't just happen overnight, but the more you use your nose, the more you're gonna regulate these CO2 levels and the more you're gonna dilate your nasal passages and the more easier it will be to breathe through your nose. Now, also when you breathe through your nose, your body produces a molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very powerful molecule and our body needs it. It's both a vasodilator and an antibacterial. So nitric oxide is gonna help prevent you from getting sick and it's also gonna help dilate your blood vessels and dilate your breathing tubes and make your breathing way more efficiently because it helps exchange that air in your lungs a lot easier. Also, there are some studies showing that your nose has these receptors in your turbinates. So your nasal turbinates are an anatomical part of your nose, and as air goes through these turbinates, it can help temper and humidify the air and make it easier for our lungs to handle. When air flows across these turbinates, it also stimulates your tongue to get out of the way. So by simply breathing through your nose and having this air go through your turbinates, your body is going to push your tongue out of the way to make your airway more open. So when you breathe through your nose, your body is making your airway more open on its own. And this does not happen in mouth breathing. Now, let's say you do all these steps and you still cannot breathe through your nose. You try to sleep all night and you have to rip that tape off and nothing's working. You still have to take that tape off. At this point, it's time to see either an ENT or an allergist because something is anatomically wrong. If you cannot breathe through your nose all night long, then something is not normal and you need to go see a specialist to either get a surgery or something done because something is preventing you from doing what humans should be capable of doing. Now, you can also try adding a nasal dilator to help breathe through your nose. These are basically just pieces of tape that are designed to go over your nose 
And what they do is they open up your nose a little bit and they allow more air to go through your nose into your lungs. These can really help to open up your nose for a while and eventually you might not even need to rely on it. Humans were meant to breathe through their nose. If you look at any animal, they are all breathing through their nose except for humans. Well, mainly westernized humans. But look at even dogs, you know, when they're excited and they're running around, you'll see them with their mouth open, they start panting. But at all other times, you'll see their mouth closed. Like look at a dog sleeping. Usually their mouth is closed and they're breathing through their nose. And actually mouth breathing in animals is a sign that something went wrong. And it's a sign that the animal is sick. Either they're sick or they have some sort of skeletal deformity, but something is not normal. And why is it that humans are the only animal in the world that is breathing through their mouth so much? In the last century, westernized humans have started using their mouths more and more. And not just because they're talking more, because they're breathing way more than before. So what does this mouth breathing do? Well, it affects many things. There's a lot of studies that are linking mouth breathing with breathing issues and sleep apnea and also skeletal deformities and a whole list of different things like your posture will change, your diet can even change from the way that you breathe. We can get into that in another video. But the point is we get way more benefits from breathing through our nose that we do not get from breathing through our mouth. So how can using a nasal dilator help specifically in preventing things like sleep apnea? Well, there was a study looking at just that. So they looked at people with sleep apnea and these were people who were considered more moderate sleep apnea. So their AHI score or their apnea hypopnea index was about 15 to 30. So they had 15 to 30 events per every hour when they were sleeping where they would either stop breathing or their oxygen levels would drop. Now this study was looking at the effects of using a nasal decongestant and using a nasal dilator on sleep apnea. No surgery, no CPAP, nothing else. Just using a nasal dilator strip and any nasal decongestant that you can get at any drugstore, even Amazon. So they were tracking the participants' sleep overnight using something called polysomnograms, which are basically what you use when you get a sleep study. And there was two different groups. So the first group, they actually sprayed a nasal dilator in their nose before sleeping and also four hours into their sleep. And they also used a nasal dilator strip. The other group was a placebo. So they sprayed a placebo up their nose and they also used a placebo nasal dilator strip. Maybe wondering how the heck could they put a placebo strip on someone's nose? Well, it's basically it's something called the sham dilator strip. It was identical to the other strip, but there was no plastic core. So it wasn't actually doing anything. It was just putting a piece of tape over their nose. So I guess this helped eliminate bias, but I really don't think I would have any bias if I was sleeping, but hey, it helps in the credibility of the study, right? So what they found is the placebo group had 39% more mouth breathing at nighttime, but the group that used the decongestant and the nasal dilator strip had only 8% mouth breathing while sleeping. So simply using a nasal dilator and using a nasal decongestant, they were able to reduce people's average mouth breathing from 39% to just 8%. Now, it wasn't just that. It also improved their sleep apnea. So the group that had the decongestant and the nasal dilator strip, their apnea scores went down a whole 12 times per hour. So they were able to move these patients who were in moderate sleep apnea to either mild sleep apnea or not even having sleep apnea at all. So simply using a nasal dilator strip and a nasal decongestant spray actually cured these people of their sleep apnea. They also slept better. So the group that had the nasal dilator strip and had the decongestant, they had less nasal obstruction and they also had more sleep efficiency. So they got less of the stage one sleep, which is your kind of initial sleep stage where you try to get into the deeper stages. And they had more stage two, stage three non-REM and REM sleep. Basically what you got to get out of that is those are your deeper sleeping stages. And a lot of people lack in getting that sleep. And that's where our body can actually heal. And that's where 
helps energize us. And getting these components of sleep will not only improve your sleep, but also improve your sleep efficiency and also make you more energized throughout the day. And also this group had less interruptions with their sleep. So they were able to sleep a whole night without waking up much easier by simply using a nasal dilator strip and a nasal decongestant spray. So what do you take away from this? Well, you take away that simply breathing through your nose and relieving some sort of nasal obstruction lowers people's sleep apnea. So we know that the nose is involved in sleep apnea, and this is just further proving that. Now, another study was even looking at how nasal dilators can help people snoring and sleep apnea. So it was looking at nasal dilators and how it affected people with sleep apnea or habitual snoring, basically people who snore a lot. And the way that they dilated the nose, they dilated the anterior part of the nose, so the valve region of the nose. And in the study, there was 10 subjects that were either snoring or had obstructive sleep apnea. And their obstructive sleep apnea scale was all over the charts. They had people who had an AHI of 1.8, so no sleep apnea, but they did snore, all the way up to 60, which is extremely, extremely severe sleep apnea. And in the study, they used polysomnography, which is, again, what you use in a sleep study, and also rhinomanometry, which is what measures your nasal airway resistance. I probably butchered that name, but you get the picture. Now, they compared these two groups, and they compared these two results with and without using that plastic nasal dilator. So when the dilator was used, there was an 18% increase in nasal airflow. So they were able to breathe through their nose way easier. And also, there was a huge reduction in their snoring frequency and also their snoring severity. So they were snoring less and they were being less obnoxious in the first place. So they also found that their sleep apnea improved. So their sleep apnea number, their AHI originally was 1.8 to 60. That was the range. And it dropped to a range of 1.3 to 15. So in other words, it dropped from an average of 18 to 6.4. So there was a 47% decrease in their sleep apnea by simply putting a little piece of plastic in their nose that helped dilate their nose. So nasal dilators are really cool because they're so simple to use and they're something that you can use at home. Now the thing is it doesn't always work, right? Because you might have some anatomy problem like a deviated septum or you might have swollen turbinates. Now some of these issues could be because you just don't use your nose enough and the more you do it, your nasal passages will dilate but sometimes it could be allergies or other issues going on that you have to get a surgery done. But for a lot of people, just using the nasal dilator strip will help them a lot. So dilators are also really good for something called nasal valve stenosis. So next time you're in front of the mirror, take a really deep inhale through your nose. And you might see that part of your nose kind of collapses. So if you see, like it kind of pushes in around here or even higher up in your nose, that is what's called nasal valve stenosis. So it could be internal, which is when it's higher up in the nose, or it could be external, your external valve collapsing, which is called the ala of your nose. Now this could also just be affecting one side of your nose, or it could be affecting both sides. But a cool trick you can try is called the caudal maneuver. So you put your hands on each side of your face and you wanna pull up and out, so kinda of like this. And you want to see how much easier that makes it for you to breathe through your nose. If that helps you a ton, like on a scale of 1 to 10, if it's like an 8, 9, or a 10 and you're able to breathe so much easier, you might want to go to an ENT because you might need some sort of procedure done if that's what it takes for you to breathe through your nose properly. Now, there's different types of nasal dilators out there. And me personally, I use something called Breathe Right Strips. You can get them on Amazon or any grocery store. They might not work if you have a lot of lotion on your face, it might fall off. And they also might rip your skin off if you have some weak skin. But these are the easiest ones to use because it's just a piece of tape that goes over your nose. There's also an internal nasal dilator that actually goes into your nose. And the cool thing about this one is you can actually crank it on each side. So let's say that your nose collapses more on your left side. You can crank the left side open a little bit more and that'll kind of even out 
your <clears throat> nasal passages. So a cool brand I've heard about is the Mute Dilator, and you can get this on Amazon or anywhere again. And there was a study that was comparing four different nasal dilators. And the reason I didn't mention the other two is because the other two didn't really have as good results in this study. So I'm only going to mention the two best dilators out there. They were measuring things called the external nasal dilator, which is that strip, nasal stents, nasal clips, which is that internal dilator I was talking about, and also septal stimulators. They found that the two dilators that I mentioned, the strip tape and also the mute dilator, they can actually relieve obstruction from that nasal collapse. So when you take a sharp inhale and your nose kind of collapses, those dilators are great at preventing that. And this is a huge alternative to surgery in a lot of people because no one wants to go through a surgery and no one wants to get a CPAP machine. And if there's a really easy way to avoid it, why not take it? A lot of the damaging effects of sleep apnea and improper breathing can be prevented if addressed at an early age. So childhood. Now, this is especially true if you use mouth tape and a nasal dilator to reinforce nasal breathing. The damaging effects of sleep apnea and improper breathing can really be prevented, especially if addressed at an early age. So childhood. I see so many kids in my practice, and a lot of them have some sort of breathing issue. So a lot of them have very obvious airway issues. And, and a lot of these signs are things that dentists will look for that relate to the breathing that a lot of people probably won't even think about. So a lot of them have these very narrow, constricted jaws, and that's related to mouth breathing. Also crooked teeth, people taking wheezing breaths, only using their upper chest to breathe, so never engaging their diaphragm. And when they're at rest or when they're walking over to the room, their mouth is open, so I can tell that they're mouth breathing. And also seeing teeth grinding, so people wearing their teeth away, and large tonsils and adenoids, and a lot of kids needing to get those removed. These are all signs that a child has mouth breathing syndrome. And we have countless evidence that breathing through your mouth instead of your nose, especially at an early age, will cause all sorts of issues, including skeletal deformities, which includes constricted jaws and narrowing of the airways, and also all of the dental problems that I mentioned above. Now, what we've also seen is that this improper breathing can also contribute to sleep apnea and also all of the diseases associated with sleep apnea. And it does this through oxidative stress because simply not being able to breathe through your nose or having nasal obstruction will create the same amount of oxidative stress in your body. And this will cause the same diseases that we associate with sleep apnea. So if you're trying to correct a child's breathing, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that they have a breathing problem in the first place. So a simple way to do this is check them when they're resting. So next time they're watching TV or sleeping or reading something or doing something like playing a game, just see their lips. And if their lips are opened, then they're probably breathing through their mouth. And that's a bad sign because now they're getting all the negative effects from mouth breathing. And also when they're sleeping, you can check if they're grinding their teeth. That's also a really bad sign because that's associated with a lot of breathing problems. Because when kids grind in their sleep, it means that something is going on with their airway and something is going on with their breathing where they cannot breathe correctly. And that's a natural response that our body does when we cannot breathe correctly. Also, you can check if they're snoring. So if a child is snoring, that automatically means that some sort of obstruction is there in the airway. This is true whether they're breathing through their nose or if their mouth is open. Also check if they're waking up with drool everywhere or they have a super dry mouth. Also, those are signs of mouth breathing. If the kid has symptoms of ADHD or you're thinking of getting them tested for ADHD, you probably want to check their airway first because a lot of the same symptoms of mouth breathing are the same symptoms as ADHD. And it has to do with being chronically tired, which is another sign. So if the kid is chronically tired, they have those same symptoms and they show the same symptoms as people who have ADHD. Also, if they're bedwetting, it's a sign that they're not sleeping well and it has to do with the airway. If they're not breathing correctly, then they're more likely to wet the bed. And also if they have asthma or allergies, all of this stuff is related to improper breathing. Now you should definitely check with your doctor before trying this on a child, but I would not recommend taping a kid's mouth until they reach the age of five. 
Before that, I just think that they're too young. Now, before you try taping a child's mouth shut, you wanna make sure that they can even breathe through their nose in the first place. So I talked earlier in this podcast about a nose unblocking exercise that you can try. And I'm putting a link to that specific part in the description below if you haven't seen it yet. So make sure you do that first if a child cannot breathe through their nose. And even if an adult is doing this, you wanna do that first. So you wanna start by placing the tape in 10 minute increments. So you wanna do this when they're awake because you can watch them. And if they have trouble, again, make sure you try that nose unblocking exercise that I was talking about. Now, another good time to do this is when the kid is napping, because again, you can watch them, but now you can kind of test and see how they'll respond when they're sleeping. So if you do decide and you eventually decide to tape the child's mouth shut when they're sleeping, there's three rules I want you to follow. So the first is the child should choose where they want to sleep. You want to make sure that they're comfortable. And they also choose who they get to sleep with because you don't want them to sleep alone when you're doing this. And the last thing is you have to tape your mouth shut too because this will prevent them from being scared of it. You don't want them to be scared to wear the tape. They'll be more comfortable if you wear it with them. Now, again, you don't want to jump to taping their mouth shut at nighttime right away because you want to make sure that they can even handle it in the first place. You want to make sure that they can breathe through their nose in the first place. And if they cannot breathe through their nose, and even after you try that nose unblocking exercise I was talking about, this is time to go to an ENT or an allergist because either their allergies are so bad that it's preventing them from breathing through their nose, or they have some sort of anatomy defect where it's preventing them from breathing through their nose. It's not normal. It's never normal if someone cannot breathe through their nose for an extended period of time because that's how we were supposed to be breathing and that's how all animals breathe. So it might take some time to getting used to, especially if they're not used to breathing through their nose. It might even take a couple weeks, but there is plenty of evidence that we were meant to breathe through their nose and that when we restore nasal breathing, that it can benefit us in so many ways and even prevent sleep apnea and other sleep disordered breathing issues. Now, one of the reasons our nose is so much better than our mouth is because our nose has this anatomy in it. So our nose has these hairs in it, and these hairs are what can kind of pick up dust and other particles, prevent it from any entering our lungs, which our mouth doesn't do. Actually, our mouth doesn't do any of the things I'm about to mention. Your nose also has mucus, and mucus is cool because it has these enzymes and these enzymes in your mucus will kill 98 to 99% of viruses and bacteria. There's plenty of evidence that people who breathe through their nose more are way less likely to get sick, and this is why. Your nose also has turbinates, and these turbinates are what help temper the air and bring it to your body temperature and also humidify the air. Because instead, when you're breathing through your mouth and you have this cold, dry air entering your lungs, you're gonna have way more inflammation in your lungs and everything's gonna kind of constrict and it's just not gonna be good for your lungs. You also have these paranasal sinuses when you breathe through your nose and as air enters through these sinuses, it produces a molecule called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, I mentioned earlier in this podcast as well, it's a very powerful molecule because it's a vasodilator and it's also an antibacterial. So not only is it going to help us with our oxygen and our lungs exchanging air, it's also going to prevent us from getting sick. And this is one of the main reasons why so many people who are mouth breathers are more likely to have swollen tonsils and adenoids because they don't get the benefit of this nitric oxide and their whole upper airway area is not as clean and now their tonsils and adenoids are gonna be more likely to get infected. There are plenty of sleep studies done where people redo their sleep study with mouth tape on, and they find that people's airway restriction was resolved by simply using mouth tape. They did the same thing with sleep apnea. There's plenty of studies that show that sleep apnea can be reduced or even cured by simply taping your mouth shut at night. And if you start correct breathing early enough, so when a person is a child, it can reinforce having good posture, help with jaw development, 
prevent serious breathing issues like sleep apnea, and even help the kid grow and reach their full potential. It might seem barbaric when you're taping a child's mouth shut and it might seem like you are doing some parental abuse, but really I think it's the opposite. If you let a kid keep breathing through their mouth and you know all the detrimental effects you get from mouth breathing and you continue to ignore it, that is more parental abuse than trying to prevent those issues. Now you might also be wondering if I am breathing too fast, why? Why did that happen? Well, the answer is stress. Stress is the only thing that will affect our breathing. And that doesn't just mean emotional stress. There's a lot of different types of stress on our body. For exercising, that's a functional stress. We're physically exerting ourselves. And it also depends on what we're eating. If we're eating a lot of unhealthy processed foods, a lot of different fast foods, then the stress from those foods is gonna also change our breathing. So a lot of people in the westernized culture specifically are breathing too quickly. And the reason is because a lot of people have this chronic stress. And what happens in turn? Their breathing gets quicker, their breathing gets more shallow, and now their CO2 levels will start to drop, and now their brainstem trigger starts to change, and it's a whole cascade, it's a whole domino effect that happens.